Thank you, Ashkan. What we're going to try to do is have a discussion and address maybe some of the complexities of the issues that have, have been talked about at the conference and maybe haven't been talked about at the conference. And so I want to start with you, Peter. What would you consider to be the most important research question. What would you consider, they said, point it right <laughs> at your mouth, they meant that. Uh, what would you consider to be the most important research question that you addressed or your lab addressed uh, when you were doing flotation research? Okay, well before I answer that question, I wanna make a comment about Ashkan's introduction of the panel. <laughs> In case you're wondering, I'm the ghost of research past. <laughs> and Arid is the ghost of research past and present, and Justin is the ghost of research future. <laughs> I don't know what Tom. Well, yeah, what does that make me? <laughs> I... <laughs> now, to, to answer your question, I think that evaluating the importance of research is left to long term. Um, examiners to see what turned out to be the most important hmm. because when you're doing the research you don't really know what's going to have the most influence uh, or the greatest effect in in coming years but I can tell you what was the most fun uh, the things that I enjoyed doing the most when I was doing flotation research was first of all the studies on creativity um, especially the first one that we did which involved my recruiting colleagues from my own psychology department to float and see if, if that affected their creativity. And if you think you have problems recruiting the general public to float, you should try a bunch of academic psychologists. That was a feat. Um, but you were the, chair of the department then, weren't you? You just I, ordered them I to. was head of the department, but that's not the kind of thing you can order people to do. <laughs> Uh, and the, the ones I, I recruited were mostly full professors, and if you know full professors, there's no way of controlling them anyway. Uh, you know, herding cats is not in it. Um, and, this, and the second one that I really enjoyed was the research on athletic performance, uh, improvement of athletic performance. I, I, got, I met people who had sports-related activities and hobbies that were somewhat offbeat. Um, members of a dart team, for example. And uh, so we had to measure m by the millimeter how close they came to the, uh, the 50 point uh, target and stuff like that, and they were fun. Uh, and it was also interesting because I, I could try, and to some extent succeeded, in teasing out what kind of sports were susceptible to improvement by having people float and what sports did not seem to be improved by that. And so, so we got some theoretical ideas out of it. The, the ones that, where it worked, were the ones where accuracy was involved. Um, basketball free throws, dart throwing, rifle marksmanship, things like that. When it was just pure muscle power, it, there was no effect. So we, we tried with uh, weightlifters and they floated and they were very good about it and so on. Didn't improve their performance one bit. So we, we were starting to make some distinction. At, you know, I talked about yesterday about what are the limits of flotation? What, what doesn't it do? So we were starting to get a, a handle on at least this aspect of what it didn't do. Uh, then I became dean and I had to stop doing research. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the creativity research, sure. what that showed? Okay, uh, the first creativity study that I did, which is the one that I just talked about, we got members of my department uh, to float for an hour and then go to their offices and, and uh, record 
the ideas that they had had while they were in the tank that were related to their work, either research or theory or both. Uh, and the control condition was the same people sat in their office for an hour and then did the ideas that they had. We counterbalanced the order, so everybody did either flotation first or the office first, so it was our uh, half and half. And what we found was that uh, months later, we asked them, we, we, we typed up their, um, their log that they wrote down about their, or their um, ideas. Um, no, I think they dictated it to a microphone and then we transcribed it. And then we gave, months later, we gave them the list, all randomized, and we said, just rate these ideas as to how useful they've been in your research or your theorizing uh, and how creative you think they are. And um, the, the ideas that, that were generated after the flow were rated significantly more creative than the ones that were generated were sitting in the office. So it was important to randomize the order. Otherwise, we didn't want them to think, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, well, that came to me while I was in the tank, so it probably was more creative. Or I, you know, I want to make the head department head feel good, so I say it was more creative. Not that anybody in that department ever wanted to make me feel good, but, but if it's randomized, you don't, and they didn't necessarily remember which was which. We asked them which was which, and, and they were all over the place. So it was a very promising uh, study, and, and um, you know, they liked it too. They, they enjoyed floating, and uh, it's a, a nice, handy piece of advice to give to junior faculty if they feel that they're not being very creative, go float. Um, then the, then the more, most recent study that we did had to do with the jazz improvisation. So I had an, I've had a number of students who are jazz musicians on the side, or maybe they're students on the side, and they're really jazz musicians, one or the other. And um, so one of them had this idea that he wanted to test um, the effects of location on music performance. And he recruited a group of uh, music majors who were specializing in jazz and did uh, before and after with floats, and then had their professors uh, in the music school uh, rate a piece of their performance. And, um, and the, the ones that they did after floating were uh, rated by the professors as being more creative. They were, they were doing um, you know, whatever they felt like doing, and um, not a set piece of music. And so it's the thing that they came up spontaneously with after the flow to a professor which is more creative than, uh, than the control group that, that did that without a flow. Okay, Arid, can you tell us what you consider to be the most important research question that your, your lab addressed with flotation tank research? With, uh the, uh, the float system, uh, again, the uh, sports uh, performance enhancement really was mo the most interesting. It was also uh, one of the greatest risks to the entire lab. We were doing a study on basket in improving basketball performance with our Washington State University basketball team on the University of Idaho. And uh, the newspapers got wind of this in Seattle and phoned the student who was in charge of running most of the experiment. Jeff Wegman, and he was so enthusiastic, he did the one thing you never do. He divulged a person's name from the study. And that turned out to be Brian Quinette before he was in the MBA. And um, he scored 60 points um, uh, two hours after floating in the tank in one single game all by himself. And WSU has known, you guys from Portland here know, were known for grasping defeat out of the jaws of victory. We still lost the game. <laughs> uh, but we had uh, a lot of volunteers. We had, we, had, we had difficulty with the control group because we were trying to hold out controls and everybody wanted to float from both teams. So that, that was the most fun. I don't know if that was the most significant, um, but that was really interesting. Marksmanship uh, turned out to be improved again. It, 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 our, our, our work was, you know, done often at the same time, and we came up with the same results, which says we do really good work, I guess, because, you know, <laughs> our, you know lab, we're using the same kind of controls versus controls, but marksmanship, we had no improvement in actual physical sports ability. We didn't do weightlifting, but we did some other things like that, you know, hand grip, and we didn't get any changes there either, but with uh, 
accuracy and calmness in, uh, uh, you know, in the face of a lot of pressure. They did better with the floating experience, and that's pretty much across the board. I mean, these results, you don't have to do a statistical analysis with because they're so obvious it really came out, which is mm -hmm. one of the neat things about rest. The results come out, whether you're using flotation rest or chamber rest, things really happen. Um, and it's important to know the ones that really happen and not try to sell things to people if they don't happen. You know, stick with the research with it. Probably the most significant, Ravi, was our discovery purely accidentally that although we didn't, we weren't able to enhance hypnotizability with the um, with flotation rest like we could with chamber rest, it did serve for people who are hypnotizable um, to take the place of a hypnotic induction. And we did uh, like Stanford scale scores, at uh, Stanford scale testing in the tank and. Uh, uh, basically, we got the same results uh, as if we'd done a formal hypnotic induction. So people, it served as a hypnotic induction, so that may be what, what happens for those people who have the ability to, uh, to enter a state of hypnosis. So that was kind of the, those are the more exciting ones. That was the pain study, right? The pilot training study was really neat. You didn't mention that. Um, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one of the things... I thought as old as he is. I thought as old as he is. But, uh. When you deal with a ghost of research past, yeah, but, uh. we deal with ghost memories. And, and sometimes we forget what we've done. Uh, I read a, a very nice study on uh, pilot trainees in a simulator. And he had them float and then do the simulator stuff, and they, oh, they yes, improve. That one. <laughs> that one, that one, that one. And then when we remind him, he remembers, yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> that one, yeah, that, that one. Very neat. Uh, so. a very good result. So, so Justin, what's the most important re research question you're currently asking? For me, the, the question that I'm, I'm starting to um, sort of make the centerpiece of of the lab is a clinical question, which is how to take a traumatized brain and heal it. I think that there's something very profound about floating and entering into what, what you might call a, um, a blank slate or a tabula rosa. It brings you back before the trauma to a state of calm, quiescence, equanimity, and to give somebody who's been traumatized in life, whether it be early in life or later in life, a chance at that, just a taste of what it's like to, to live without that trauma affecting every aspect of your being, I think could be an enormously uh, a huge finding. But right now, there hasn't been a single study that I'm aware of looking at floating and PTSD or even early childhood trauma. And so the hope is over the next few years, we're going to try to develop a proper randomized controlled trial to investigate this. And then if the results bear out what I think they will, you could get places like the VA hospital or even psychiatrists and psychologists using this as the prescribed treatment. So this sounds like a clinical question. That's a clinical question, yeah. Could, could it be, Justin, um, that when a person begins to have glimmering recurrences of the trauma mm -hmm. in the environment which is reciprocally inhibiting of a traumatic type of flashback reaction right, right. that you're actually getting a reciprocal inhibition effect. Exactly. My, my work with PTSD is hypnosis where we actually relive essentially the uh, experience and help the person overcome it um, by becoming very, very physiologically and psychologically active with it and then we encourage them to actually go through it. And with the uh, ego strength of the psychologist doing hypnosis, we overcome the trauma Right. Whatever is remembered. And it's important, by the way, what, what is remembered is often has nothing to do with the actual truth, but that's not what counts in therapy. That's right. It's what is encoded that counts. Yeah. So whatever they come, come up with in an environment like that, um, that could have tremendous treatment effects, and I wish I'd thought of it, that. No, well, I'm I, glad you did. <laughs> right now, what we know about trauma treatment is the most effective in terms of evidence-based treatment involves what's called prolonged exposure, right. which a read in talking about uh, hypnosis and having them relive the trauma, prolonged exposure without using hypnosis, except if you're doing EMDR, um, in a sense is getting them to relive the trauma over and over again. So how, how do you think introducing people 
to the tank mm -hmm. with the expectation that they are going to experience that trauma. How do you think that would best be done in a research design? For a reader? Yeah, for you. Okay. We'll start with you and then. So, I mean, part of what has to happen is, and I think this is important for float center owners to realize as well, when you're dealing with a traumatized brain, you don't want to push them too hard. It's fragile. And I'm personally averse to the idea of sort of just throwing them into the void with no grounding skills, no preparation, and having them sort of face um, their, their deepest and darkest fears and memories. So I think a lot of grounding techniques prior to even getting into the tank, teaching them basic skills like focused awareness on the breath, relaxation techniques, body awareness, and then slowly getting them into the full immersive float experience. Um, I've always viewed it as kind of a hierarchical approach. You don't want to uh, start right away and do the full flooding, but more sort of baby steps along the way. It could really run the risk. Uh, I don't like prolonged expo exposure for that. I mean, we do uh, a reliving of the experience. They're, they're short and very intense and there's psychological and physiological exhaustion. And I agree entirely with what, what you're saying. I mean, if we create an expectation, the person gets into that, you can run the risk of re-traumatizing. Re right. A lot of these repeated exposure things just re-traumatize the patient because there's no um, resource, there's no um, what we call restructuring, rebuilding mm -hmm. after to put the person back together. Yeah. And you darn well better have people who are, uh, who are good with uh, ab reactions if yeah. around at the time. That's so exactly with experience. right. But it's, it's unlikely to happen if it's done, if it happens spontaneously, because when a person recalls something, they recall it because they want to recall it, That's they're right. ready to recall it. It's not like a flashback where a sound of a backfiring car reminds them of being shot at or watching their buddy get killed or something mm -hmm. like that. So we have some questions that were submitted, and I thought I would put them to the panel and let the panel sort of run with how they want to answer these questions. The first one deals with the number of floats and the timing of floats. Is that an important thing in terms of achieving the desired effect? So from, from, from our research experience, do the number of floats per week does that make a difference? The length of the float make a difference? I mean, right now we're seeing many centers using 90-minute floats. From the standpoint of our research, how long, uh, I, I think that most of our research, we use 45 to 50-minute floats. We even shortened it to 35 minutes in some studies. Uh, how long were the floats in your studies, Peter? Well, as I said yesterday, uh, that question, both, both parts of that question are in the category of things we know we don't know. Right. We don't know what the optimal time period is in the tank, and we don't know what the optimal number of floats in any given period of time is either. We used an hour, randomly more or less, because that's what a lot of people were using, but I don't know whether that's the optimal period or not, it may be a little too short, maybe we'd get better effects a little longer, maybe we could get the same effect a little shorter. We just, somebody needs to do the parametric research. How long were the, when, when you tried to achieve hypnotizability in the flotation tank, Reed, how long did people stay in? Uh, those are just one hour floats. Uh, okay. Again, we, we don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I so, don't know. so you described. Research, yeah. Tom, is that it's not exciting. Well, I, I, I understand That's that. That's why nobody's doing it. I, but I thought we could at least address this question a little bit. Um, Areed, yes, uh, today, when you said that flotation does not increase hypnotizability, but the in dry tank... we did. We did about Yeah, right. Down, but know. the dry tank did. That was a six-hour study, right? Yes. Yeah. So w we really don't have data that tells us what would happen with a four-hour study or a five-hour study of people floating. We only have data with a one-hour study. And so in future research, somebody could, if they wanted to, try these longer studies to see if it had an effect on hypnotizability. 
Well, this is like a similar issue to some of Peter's work with smoking cessation, right? So with yeah. chamber rest, you get very clear results right. after 24 hours. Yes, we did, we did do parametric research on that, and we tried 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30. Yeah. Any result that we would get at all, that we got, we got with 30, we already got with 24, and we did not get with the shorter period. So mm -hmm. 24 was apparently the best period for chamber rest for, for that particular application. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did with the uh, problem foods category. Yes. We had some effect yeah. at 12, optimal at 24, nothing at 3, nothing at 6. Right. The other thing with, in terms of getting the optimal float times, as the uh, psychophysiological instrumentation has yeah. improved that's a right. lot um, in terms of that, we should be able to get some real data. Like we, right. we can get in the chamber, we have that data for the chamber that's a lot easier to keep electrodes on when you're not floating in salt water and so forth, you know, so yeah. you'll be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that's really interesting, we've, we've already started uh, beta testing. We, we have a number of different units that are wireless, that are waterproof, salt-proof, non-invasive. And we could look at the relaxation response. So you could take blood pressure, for example. And mm -hmm. It's clear that for a lot of people, blood pressure is just going down within the first 20 to 30 minutes of a float. And you could kind of see the drop off over time, and you could try to find the point in time where blood pressure starts coming back up again. And maybe that would be a, a good cutoff for where you might say that's the, the float effect. You want to stop once it reaches the, the bottom and then starts coming back up. Okay, you're, you're ready to come out. And so you could use physiological equipment to kind of dictate what would be the ideal float to say maximize the relaxation response. So would you say that's a direction that future research should be going? I think so. I mean, one of the questions I get asked by every colleague of mine is, what's the dose of floating? And I, it, it's a strange question because, you know, this is not a drug. But nevertheless, the, the Western medical model is all about dose. And so to be able to give people a precise answer to that, I think, would be beneficial. Are there any physical disorders that would be automatically, uh, essentially, excluders from floating. So one, one question was uh, CHF, which is coronary heart failure, chronic. It, are those things excluders? Do we know that? Or how do we decide what should be excluded or not? I, I remember in our early research, one thing we decided that we were going to exclude was anyone with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And we were partly concerned that if a person began to enter into a low uh, a theta state, uh, that it might trigger an epileptic seizure. Um, but do you, does the panel have any thoughts on this? What you excluded from your research, are you excluding anything right now from your research? Psychiatrically, I mean, I think there's a lot of things we need to be wary of until we have more data. Um, two things that I just don't know about, and maybe people in the audience could, could illuminate us. If you have somebody who's extremely depressed, maybe suicidally depressed, and is a chronic ruminator, it's not clear to me whether or not the tank would exacerbate that. And so that is one of my concerns. Then also, if you have somebody who's actively psychotic, um, is the tank going to exacerbate, say, their delusions or their hallucinations? And, and I don't know if there's uh, any data to speak to that. So for me, I think it's less about exclusion and more about treading cautiously until we have more data. Well, we excluded from both the chamber and the float people who are deeply depressed because we had the experience with a few of them that they spent, this was in the chamber, they spent the 24 hours reflecting on how bad they were and how mm -hmm. bad their life was, and you know, that's not helpful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we, and of course, with the tank, uh, we included people who had a rash that would be made painful yeah. by the solution. Yeah. Um, and we also excluded pregnant women, which mostly because we were afraid that if something went wrong, we'd be sued. Yeah. Uh, we didn't think anything would go wrong, but, but it didn't have to go wrong during that hour. If it, if it had gone wrong any time, right. you know, we could have been held liable. Uh, although, as I said yesterday, apparently there are some studies that show that 
the, um, the physical discomfort of pregnancy is lightened uh, by floating. But A, we didn't know that at the time, and B, we still wouldn't want to take the chance. Right. You bring up a really important point, I think, with running subjects or running uh, just participants who just want to experience it. A, a lot of the cautions are simply because if something coincidentally happens in the, in the environment, you're held to blame, whether, whether it has anything, to, whether there's any causality at all. In the environment, uh, or, or, in the environment afterwards. or afterwards, yeah. exactly. What did you experience today? Well, yes, you yeah. know, yeah. So that's, and that's, uh, we have to err on the side of caution, I think. Now, of course, the person doesn't tell you when you're running a tank center, that's a, that's a different situation. But you might want to have some, some kind of disclosure statement. Are any of you aware of any research that's been done on traumatic brain injury or concussions using flotation? There was a researcher at LIBOR who studied this, not with flotation, but he studied traumatic brain injury and he studied post-concussive syndrome. And what he told me essentially was the, the most commonly prescribed treatment for somebody after a concussion is reduce your stimulation, rest. And boy, wouldn't this be a great environment to do that in. So as far as I know, I don't know of any studies that have been done, but Theoretically, it makes sense that if somebody just had a concussion, having them in a float tank could actually be very beneficial. Um, Peter, I know that you did some work post ECT using chamber rest. Um, not that ECT is a concussion, it's not. But could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think most people are not familiar with that research. Okay. Um, we were working in collaboration with the psychiatry department at the university, uh, and they referred to us some patients who were getting ECT, mostly because they were depressed. Um, and what we were really interested in was to look at the competing hypotheses that we had found with, with uh, chamber rest that it improved memory, but there was this general um, set of reports and, and anecdotal reports and so on that ECT was a, a memory destroyer. And so we wondered if we put people in uh, rest after ECT, would that balance out the effects of the ECT? And what we did was, was when they came for the uh, uh, rest uh, session, uh, we would uh, put them in the, in the chamber and then when they were finished, um, we would give them a variety of memory tests for things that they had learned prior. And what we found was that there was no effect. Uh, that is, there was no um, forgetting of the material that they had learned prior to ECT. Uh, their test scores on the, on the memory test were just as good. Uh, as before the ECT. This was basically a demonstration project. I, we did, it wasn't a full-blown experiment. We didn't do controls. Um, but, you know, th there's so much of the self-reports that, that memory was, was uh, had deteriorated after ECT that, that the tentative conclusion that I came to was that we were using the wrong tests that some kinds of memory are impaired and other kinds are not, which is a step in the right direction because previously it was believed that all kinds of memory were, were negatively affected. So I think we at least, at least tentatively demonstrated that it's not necessarily all kinds of memory, but we didn't rule out some kinds of memory. Mm -hmm. If you were starting a research program today, Areed, what would you study with flotation? Well, actually, I think Justin's got a good handle on what has to be done. We have, we have a lot of things we need to know about duration, we need to know about physiological effects, and you're set up to really do that properly. And I think we need, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to be learned, and then we'll have data in terms of what's good for this, what's good for that, what's the duration for this kind of, for this kind of a, uh, a need, whether it's a sports performance thing, what's the duration for somebody just wanting to calm down, how often you know mm -hmm. it should be so we have something you can offer the public which is based on science rather than based on 
you know, uh, sensation seeking, which I think, which is a great way to get people started in it. But they might continue if they're getting optimal results from it, and that's the kind of data we need. It'd be a lot of this, you know, a lot of the research that's not so exciting because we need to, we need to know things like duration, we need to know the optimal for different things. You know, when you think of uh, TMI, traumatic brain injury, this, this, you know, the number of people with PTSD, with co having had combat stress syndrome, mm -hmm. for example, um, this is this is a large number who have TMI. This could be a great opportunity to try to deal with that as well. Uh, but again, we don't know. That's the exciting part. So I think the first step would be to get a hold of Justin's apparatus. <laughs> <laughs> what are, are you talking? What's under his cranium, or are you talking <laughs> about <laughs> the physical facility? Not, not either or. <laughs> <laughs> So, Justin, where do you see your research going in the next year, year and a half? What, how, what projects are you going to do above what we saw yesterday? Well, I think, at least for the next year, we're still trying to answer some very basic questions that are waiting to be answered. And, and to be honest, I mean, I was surprised that they hadn't already been answered. So one of the things I discussed yesterday is, you know, we need to know if magnesium is being absorbed through this high concentration salt bath. And so that's one of the things we're going to know probably within the next year, whether that is actually happening. Um, we need to understand more about what's happening in the brain and in healthy people, because eventually my research program is going to be really clinical based. And until we have some sort of understanding what's happening in the healthy, normal brain, we really can't make any sort of conclusions as to what's going on in the non-healthy brain. So I think for at least the next year, it's going to be answering very basic questions about what's happening um, in the body and the brain in healthy floaters, and then very quickly, uh, probably in the next two to three years, shifting into clinical uh, um, issues like post-traumatic stress disorder, anorexia, and so forth. When you say what's happening in the brain of of health, healthy people in the next year and a half. The, the study that you showed yesterday really looked at an fMRI right after right. they floated. What, what do you have on, on the drawing board for trying to get a feel for if somebody's floating regularly, yep. what happens to their brain, but we're not going to look at it right after they floated? Right. Well, what's really neat about this magnesium study is it's a longitudinal study. We're going to take people before they've ever floated, we're going to scan their brain, and we're going to let them float uh, uh, twice a week for five to six weeks, an hour and a half each time. So by the end of about a month or so, they've had 15 to 20 hours of float exposure. And then we're going to scan their brain again afterwards, then a month afterwards. And one of the neat things that we've developed is you could do automated algorithms to look at the physical structure of the brain. So we could look at things like cortical thickness. And what you might find is with floating, the physical structure of the brain could be altered. And our prediction would be the areas of the brain that map the internal world of our body might start flourishing. And you might actually see physical changes and expansion in those body maps that are happening in the brain. So I think one of the, the studies that we're going to be doing over the next year is actually trying to look at physical structural brain changes induced by the floating experience. Is there any evidence from other types of practices, mindfulness, meditation, mm -hmm. yoga, et cetera, that that kind of change actually can occur with regular practice of something? There's a lot of studies that use what's called the between subject design. So you'll take a group of people who you know, have been meditating their whole life and have you know, 20,000 hours of meditation practice, and then you take a group of people who haven't, and you find major changes between these groups. But you know, the study that I'm talking about is really a within subject study. You take the same individual, you, you look at changes within their own brain, and that's pretty rare. Even in the meditation literature, you rarely see somebody tracking that individual over time and looking for changes within them. So uh, the truth is this, is, this will be a really um, exciting finding if we find anything. Do you have any speculation what parts of our brain would change with regular floating? 
You know, the, the area that we think is going to change the most is what Dr. Simmons presented yesterday. It's, it's an area of the brain called the insular cortex, but in particular, there's a part of the insular cortex that receives all the input from our internal world of the body, and the vagus nerve in particular. And it's called the dorsal mid-insula. And this is pretty much the first area of cortex that receives input about things like what's happening in your heart, what's happening in your gut. And what uh, uh, we would expect is this is the area that would actually see the most changes. And so you'd expect thickening, which would imply increase in neurons. Exactly. So, you know, the idea, I, as I told you yesterday, even a single two millimeter voxel has about 100,000 neurons. So if we see even, you know, a 10 or 20 percent change, who knows how many new neurons that actually equates to. And why do new neurons appear? Well, this is, this is the exciting times we're in. I mean, 20 years ago, when you would teach neuroscience to somebody, you know, it was like, all right, you're born with your brain and your neurons, and once you reach a certain age, it's over. You know, those, those neurons will start disappearing as you become demented, and, you know, life is over. And so what, what really happened that I think changed the whole field of neuroscience about a decade or so ago is this idea of neuroplasticity, the idea that we're growing new neurons all the time and it happens throughout our life. And so to tap into this concept of neuroplasticity and to use floating as sort of a tool to actually enhance it, I think that's a fascinating way to go. Arid, I know you've, you, a lot of your recent work has been with hypnosis. Is there any evidence of this with hypnosis? Not that I know of. I okay. mean, we know what happens when we enter the hypnotic state. Well, we have it's the anterior cingulate. We did, we did the changes yeah. with being able to be, we know that the, uh, Pain effects have nothing to do with releasing endorphins, very similar to what happens. With Tell us a little bit more about that, because that, that applies to your study, and I think every, everybody would like to understand that a little bit more deeply. Well, it depends which little bit you want, because I, that's, that's about all I talk about for the last 30 years. But um, uh, one, one of the exciting things, people often thought that the uh, hypnotic effects on pain control, and this, by the way, is nothing new. Uh, Ernest Hilgard, Jack Hilgard at Stanford, it produced 20 years of research, uh, gave himself his own building, Jordan Hall. He had to become Dean of Arts and Sciences to do that uh, for doing hypnosis research. And he's the one who established uh, you know, reliable measurement of hypnosis. But the pain control aspects were studied, and it was thought for a while, well, hypnosis is releasing endorphins. And they did some studies by injecting folks with naloxone, and it turned out that they were able to uh, uh, attenuate, reduce, or eliminate pain completely with hypnosis uh, anyway. So it appears to be a dissociation effect. Uh, I've had some personal experience with that. I'm only average hypnotizable. I went through surgery with that as, a, as an effect. And okay. uh, it's, I was surprised it worked, frankly. So it's not expectations, as some people think it is. Um, and, uh, but expectation effect are things I think we have to think about in breast research. But one of the things that really struck me, which, is I, which has pertained to hypnosis research for many decades, is that initially with between group designs, many good findings were missed because it was obliterated in the fog of the differences in subjects. But within subjects' designs, it was able to give us clues as to what's really happening, mm. the changes that happen. You know, for example, you find if you're going to do a, um, say you hypnotize somebody and you tell them um, that um, they're um, not going, there's a cardboard box blocking the, uh, computer screen in front of them, we have a flashing image to do like a, an oddball paradigm for doing the book potentials. Um, and what will happen is um, they will have a reduction at the P300 vote potential. Mm -hmm. It doesn't disappear. They actually have to receive the signal to make it go away because it's happening at the executive level. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of things like that in REST we haven't touched, touched looking at yet. And maybe the EPIC model that Kyle was talking about right. yesterday becomes a a global model to sort of understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been very, very interesting. And uh, we actually have one more minute. So, Peter, I want you to wrap up with basically what you would like to see in the future of REST research. Wow. <laughs> I would like to see it universally accepted. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Uh, First of all, you know, I, I wasn't kidding about the apparatus. Uh, I think that having 
equipment that can do what Justin's equipment can do is a tremendous step forward in flotation research. Uh, the only thing I would wish for in addition was scanning devices, PET scan and MRI that can do it while you're in the tank. Oh, and wouldn't I'm, that be amazing? I, I expect you're on the way. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think there's one, there, there's one alternative to that, and that is if we can build a tank that'll fit into an MRI. So, so that may be the first engineering feat. We just have to get our tank designers and the MRI designers together. Well, actually, you know, the dry float tank is easier uh, for, for that purpose. Yeah. Right, because right? you don't have to worry about the corrosion from the salt and all that stuff. And then I think we do, we, you know, we kept talking about doing parametric studies, and we need to know what the optimal uh, length of flotation is, and presume, I, I would guess there'd be different optimal lengths for different purposes, mm -hmm. and we haven't looked at that at all. Yeah. Uh, and how long the after effect lasts, mm -hmm. we don't really know that. You get people who reduce their blood pressure, well, how long does that last? Um, and then again, how many floats per what amount of time? And, um, and then we, we've, I mean, we've identified lots and lots of important problems and important questions that should be addressed by looking at flotation as, a, as an investigative tool. Um, and as I said yesterday, there are also a lot, of, a lot out there that we haven't even thought of, right. but presumably that will come, come to us as we go along and as more people come into the field. Well, so maybe we can challenge the community of flotation to be active in a way that will get either the, the government who funds us through NIH or NIMH to realize that we need these studies done, or we come up with our crowdfunding mechanism, get our own energy together to be able to generate the funds necessary for this type of research. Thank you very much. This is very <laughs>